let's do a little excursion in our course. So far, whenever we've been using functions within Haskell programs, they came from various modules. Most of the functions came from the so-called prelude me uh, module, but we have been using some other modules so far as well. But all these functions are actually coming out of a package that is called base. And the base package ships with GHC. So that means that whenever you have GHC installed, you have all the modules that make up the base package already on your system. But the base package is not supposed to be an all-encompassing standard library in Haskell. It just contains relatively <clears throat> minimalistic functionality. And it is not uncommon that very soon you have to go beyond the base package. And that is where Hackage comes in. Hackage is the main Haskell package repository where all open source Haskell packages are uploaded. Well, not all, but by far the most and um, can be can be found in a central place. And um, uh, the, um, the address of Hackage is hgpshackagehaskell.org. So let's look at that page for a moment. So that is the home page or the front page of Hackage. It's not particularly nice or concise, perhaps. But um, we have a search box up here in which we can type in names of packages, such as base. Base is itself also on Hackage, primarily for reference. And then we can click on a package name. And then for every package, we get the name, a short description. We can see which versions of the package are available on Hackage. So whenever um, functionality and packages is changed and the packages themselves like increase their version number according to certain principles. And um, there is a list of the modules that are contained in the package. And you can see that in the base package, we have quite a few modules, including a couple of familiar modules, such as data.list, um, for all the list functions. I think we have seen data.character for all the character-based functions. We have seen a few of these, but not very many. Right? There are lots of GHC internal modules in base as well. But in particular, there is also the prelude. You can click on these modules, and then you'll get interface documentation for that particular module. And you can see that for the Prelude, you, again, you get lots of familiar um, uh, entities reported, such as here, the bool type with its constructors false and true. You can see what instances are defined for bool, the AND and the OR function. So it starts with stuff on Booleans, but then we have the maybe type with the constructors nothing and just instances that are available for the maybe type either, and so on, right? It's a really long module. The, the Prelude has quite a number of things that it um, exports. And most of these aren't actually defined directly in the Prelude. They're defined in other modules, but then ultimately re-exported from the Prelude. So often you can actually here click on the source link that is to the right and jump to the actual Haskell source code that defines a particular thing. But for base, this is um, often broken. Um, or yeah, I mean, for the prelude in particular, but for base in general, I think this is unfortunately often broken. But we'll see this in um, another context in a minute. Nevertheless, you can, you can try this. As I said, base has a little bit of a special status. It is normally shipped with GHC. It is not directly downloadable from Hackage. It is most, mostly included there for reference. That's why it um, behaves slightly different from most other libraries. Now, in the context of I.O., if you want to 
uh, play with more interesting things, we rather quickly leave base behind. So if we want to have more interesting functions to, for example, do disk I.O. or network I.O. or even just to do something with random numbers, we need other packages. So let's go back to the front page and go to the search list again and look for a package that is called random, which we are going to use for random number generation. And we see that this is a much smaller package with much fewer versions. The current version is 1.2.0. There is a little bit of a, a documentation up front. It also only has a few modules. And the primary module is called system.random. OK, and then we have explanation on how system.random works. And here, if we, for example, look for a particular function, let me see, look a bit further, there is a function random RIO, which is a function that we are going to use. And here we can actually hopefully click on the source link and actually get somewhere. And we can see that this is the definition of random RIO. It is defined in terms of some other functions that are also defined in this library. It's not actually a primitive function. And we can even click on some of these in the source code in order to get to those definitions. So you can figure out how things are defined internally via Hackage rather quickly, even though that will perhaps still lead to you encountering concepts that you do not currently fully understand. Right. So as for the type of random RIO, there is a random class, which is apparently specific to this random library of types that support uh, the generation of random values of. So for example, if we want to generate a random integer, then integers should be part of the random class. If we want to generate a random uh, character, then character should be part of the random class. But if we want to define our own data type for our particular application, we might want to make it an instance of the random class as well so that we can generate random values of that data type. And then it takes a range and this range is actually somewhat curiously and unusually for Haskell given as a pair rather than in curate form. So sort of an, a lower bound and an upper bound. And then we get an IO of, um, of A. So this, is, this belongs to a class called Monad IO, but you can just assume that when you read M, you read IO for the time being. So um, generates an an IO action returning such an A. And um, so that means when executed, we'll get effectively a random value. And in the background, this does make use of side effects, right? Because it's initializing a random number, a pseudo random number generator and maintaining some state for the pseudo random number generator. So every time we execute um, uh, an action like this, we will get an actually different random number. There are lots of other random number generators available on Hackage with different requirements. So you should be very careful if you if you really want to use random numbers or pseudo random numbers for any purpose, what kind of requirements you have, right? what kind of um, fairness and uh, uh, security requirements you have for these random numbers. And you should pick uh, a random number generator that uh, that is adequate for um, for your particular application area. But if we just want to get an impression and want to get some practice with IO functions or IO actions, then this is definitely fine. Right. Another package that we're going to look at is directory. So let's go back once more. Type directory. Directory is giving us a little bit more in terms of file system operations. So again, this is a much smaller package, right? We only have a handful of modules. We have 
Uh, still quite a few versions. It's around for quite some time. The current version is 1.3.6.2. And the main module is called system.directory. And um, in particular, we find things here such as whether a particular file path even exists on a file system. So that is functionality, which is interesting, right? Whether a file or a directory of a given name actually exists. And that obviously cannot give a bool result. It must give an IO bool result because it's not deterministic. The, the file path alone is not enough to determine whether the answer should be yes or no. We actually have to look on the disk of the machine that you're executing this on at a particular time to see whether that file path exists. Right? So, um, and that is exactly what executing this IO action does. And there are many other um, operations in here, such as detecting metadata about a file, for example, its size, or um, uh, like operating with a directory structure, changing directory, um, and so on and so forth. Right? So there are quite a few interesting operations here. So these are two example packages that are not base that we um, want to look at. Uh, so, how do we do this from a Haskell program if we want to use this functionality in a Haskell program of our choice? So, <clears throat> if I start um, creating a file, let's call it random.hs, and I start as user, usual, and I just say import system random. Then you'll see that um, you get system.random underlined. And it'll say, I could not find module system random. It's not a module in a current program or in any known package. So there is no magic knowledge of all of package available somehow to GHC. Right? So if we want to use other packages, we have to create a package of our own and use some extra tooling around GHC to, um, to basically uh, configure the package and make it clear to GHC that the other packages that we are needing are now also on our system. And we obviously also have to potentially install them. So how does that work? Let's leave the editor just for a bit, and let's make um, uh, a new directory package demo, I'll call this. So this is an empty directory now. And I'm going to use a tool called Cabal. So this is actually a tool that is available under the name Cabal install, but the executable is just called Cabal. And Cabal is a sort of packaging tool for, um, for Haskell. It can be used to build projects, Haskell projects that consist of multiple packages. And in, in particular, uh, you, you can define your own packages with it. And it does um, sort of all the maintenance in the background. It um, resolves the dependencies between different packages, the versioning between packages. It installs packages that you haven't uh, yet got but need for your project on your machine. And it also invokes GHC for you with the right flags so that GHC will find these packages. Um, there is another tool called Stack which follows a slightly different philosophy in places, but is roughly usable for the same kinds of things. Some people in the Haskell world use Cabal, other people use Stack. In this course, I will demonstrate things using Cabal. So in order to create a package on our own in which we can then declare what other packages we depend on, the easiest way to do this is to just invoke cabal init. So that is basically um, initialization of a cabal package in the current directory. That's why I created a new directory. And then I can give some flags, which are 
optional. If I just run Cabal init now, it's going to be an interactive init process. So I'm going to be asked lots of questions and you can certainly do that. But I'm going to um, uh, pass a flag dash M, which basically says minimal. So I, I want to have an absolutely bare minimum of a resulting file. And I'm already going to say dash dash lib to indicate that I'm going to try to define a package here that is itself a library rather than an executable. So most of the time, if we're just playing with other code and we're writing little functions in modules, we're not interested in actually having a main program that we can execute in the end. So then library is a good default if we just um, uh, implement several functions or actions that we want to uh, play with. And then I'm going to run this. And then I'm going to get some messages. And actually, Cabal init even takes the, the contents of this directory, if there are already contents of this directory, in, into account. So if you have already Haskell source code lying around, it may detect this and guess the right package dependencies for you. Um, it also generates a license, but in this case, there is no indication as to what license we want. So, um, so that is also a left, it generates a change log file, which is just good habit for, for Cabal packages, um, for packages in, in Haskell who have some change log information, how they evolve, but it's not particularly important for us. Then it generates a stop source file because we don't have any source files now. And it actually generates this in a subdirectory src mylib.hs. And actually look at this very briefly. So there is really not very much in here. It uh, just generates a module header, actually with an ex with an explicit export list here that some func is being expo uh, exported. Some func is then defined to be an IO action of type unit, and there's just a call to put string line. So it's really just a stub. We don't even need to use this file if we don't want to. And then this is the file why we're doing this. Like otherwise, we would have had to write this one by hand, and that is slightly tedious. So package demo dot cabal. The name package demo comes from the directory name in this case. And if we look at package demo dot cabal, we see that it's a file that has a particular uh, special format format of cabal files. In cabal files you have mostly particular field names that are um, ending with a colon, and then there is a value to the right of that. And then there are so-called stanzas for different components that the package is actually defining. In this case, we have said that the package should be a library package, so there is just one library stanza. And um, let's look at just all the contents of this file very briefly. This first line cabal version is just some metadata. The cabal package format itself may evolve at certain stages. So this is setting some sort of minimum standard to parsers of this file as to what version of the cabal format they should at least understand. And that in this case is 2.4. That's just, I can um, consider that a random number. Uh, then we have the name of the package, which again defaults to the directory name. We have the version of the package, which defaults just um, uh, generally to 0.1.0.0. In general, versioning of packages in uh, Haskell follows the package versioning policy, PVP for short. That is also explained in some places. It is um, a little bit similar in style, if you're familiar with it, with semantic versioning but it um, is, is uh, different in the details. So essentially we have four version component numbers. The first one is completely free to choose for the author of the package. There are no uh, requirements. So this is sort of the most major version number, but you only increment this when you feel like it. There, there are no um, requirements to ever increment it. And in fact, it's quite common, even though that makes libraries and Haskell look inherently unfinished, but it's quite common to leave it as its default value zero forever, essentially. Right? But some people put other numbers in there. Then the second component is the actual so-called major version number. So whenever you 
um, roughly speaking, do an interface incompatible change to your package, you have to bump the major version number. The third component is a minor version number. So there are certain changes which are considered harmless enough in your interface, such as just adding new functions, for example, but not changing the types of existing ones or removing existing functions that are considered minor. So then you only have to bump the minor version number. And the fourth component is sort of for cosmetic changes to a package. Like if you only do documentation changes or add some extra files to the package that don't actually affect the source code, then, um, uh, then you can bump this last component. So this is just a default. And then we have an author and a maintainer. And this is, in this case, I think, taken from my, uh, my Git configuration, um, what my default uh, uh, name and email address there is. And then um, this change log was generated by itself. So this is a pointer to it that um, this is sort of an extra file that belongs to the package. And then we get to the actual sort of Haskell source part. In the library stanza, we have um, which modules actually belong to this library. So this is at the moment only this stop module that has been generated there. Which packages my module depends on. So in this case, it says base. And then this strange operator here says like anything above, but not too far above 4.14.1.0. So essentially anything between 4.14.1.0 and the next major version, so 4.15 in this case, anything between that range. And um, so you can, you can specify packages you want to depend on here and their version ranges. And then we have SRC. Um, that is the Haskell source directory. So that is the directory underneath the, uh, the package, or the path we are currently in, in which uh, we are putting our Haskell source files. So that can actually be the same directory as we're currently in. Then you put this to be dot rather than SRC. Then uh, everything is at the top level, but it's a good habit to put the, the actual source files in a subdirectory. And then ultimately, we have already seen that GHC supports language extensions and so forth. And there are also different language standard revisions. And the current Haskell standard revision is still Haskell 2010. And GHC still supports the even older um, Haskell 98 standard as well. So whatever should be the baseline um, uh, is put here. And Haskell 2010 is the, is, the, is the common baseline. That's also roughly what you get if you just start GHC on its own. So that explains what we have. All right, and now I can, um, yeah, and this Cabal package format, this is understood both by this Cabal tool, right, but also by Haskell language server. So if, um, if you start your editor now with the um, source file in SRC from this directory, it will pick up the um, package demo cabal file and will take that information into account as well. So one thing that is important now is though that you should not um, run GHC on your Haskell source files directly anymore. You should invoke GHC through um, cabal. So if you want to build the package or load it into GHCI, you should use cabal commands for it. In particular, if you want to load it into GHCI, you should use cabal REPL. REPL is for read, eval, print loop. And that is just a common abbreviation for tools like GHCI that, um, that give you an interactive environment. And if you type cabal REPL, you don't need to say the name of the source file because the name of the source file is defined in the cabal file itself. Right? it'll tell you that um, certain flags it's using, right? And it will also start building packages. In this case, it might, it might download or build dependencies. In this case, we don't have any um, dependencies. It's still only base. Um, so it'll build package demo. Um, and, um, and then it loads the file that um, 
uh, is part of package demo into GACI, and we ultimately have our environment as user usual. And if you remember, there was this some func stop uh, func action defined in uh, in this module. That was, I think, the only thing that was defined in this module, and we can execute it, and it basically prints its own name. So, so that works as before. Now the reason we're doing all this is that we want to depend on the random and the directory packages, all right? So um, let's start editing our cabal file. So I'm going to just open um, an editor with the directory. Um, and then I'm just going on the cabal file here, and I'm just going to edit the um, the build depends myself. So I could also edit the exposed modules and change the module name, but let's keep the mylib.hs for the time being. So I'm I'm okay with using that module name. I'm going to do something slightly strange, namely to remove the bound on the base package, but because base is intricately tied to GHC, so if we um, put rather narrow bounds on the base package we're expecting, we're effectively tying our package to very few versions of GHC that it can actually work with. And um, I want um, you not to run <clears throat> into any problems if you're um, trying this yourself and you're experiencing different versions and you're using the course perhaps with a slightly different version of GHC than I'm having here right now. So I'm I'm going to take a risk and just drop the version bound on, on base. And, um, of course, that means that if base changes, then uh, uh, like we may be using functions and other things may just break during the build, but that's a risk anyway. So, and then for the random package, I'm going to use version one zero. I'm going to say I want to have at least version one zero. Um, using a similar syntax here. Um, sorry, now I forgot. Uh, this way around, I <laughs> I actually always have a little bit of trouble remembering the exact order of this operator. So let's just take this. Um, yeah, or I could say one zero dot dot, or just one. Uh, uh, sorry, one one two version one two, um, and then for directory, what was the current version? Let's take a one three six two. So let's say one three six uh, at least. And we could put these on different lines. That's allowed by the. Um, by the cabal format. Okay. So now we have updated our cabal file accordingly, right? And um, now if I go to my source file and um, let me get rid of this exported function here. Now I should be able to say import system.random and it's possible that you have to trigger sort of um, Haskell language server to actually pick up the changes to the cabal file. There is probably a magic key combination, but it's not always automatically picking this up. So um, what we can do is we can just restart the editor perhaps. And you see that now it has picked up um, the changes to the cabal file. It takes the cabal file into account and it suddenly finds the module. So um, in the background, it has configured the package so that the random um, uh, package has been installed. And we should ideally be able to just say import system directory now as well. Okay, very good. And let's leave the editor once more, and let's actually <clears throat> see how we can do this in in GHCI. 
So again, we should now say Cabal REPL and not call GHCI directly. But even with our changed file, it still loads. And again, it does not actually print these extra packages that have to be downloaded or built because now a Haskell language server has already done this for us. It is possible that if you've never used Cabal before, that you have to run Cabal update first in order to get the latest packages from Haskell. So if it <clears throat> if you get an error message telling you that um, a random or directory are not known package names at all, then uh, a Cabal update is a is a good is a good mechanism because it basically just contacts Hackage, as you can see and updates the, the package list to have the latest metadata available. Right. And now if we if we use Cabal REPL, we can see that things like, uh, because we've imported um, <coughs> system directory into our, into our mylib module, um, we have something like does path exist available now as a function to use, which is of type file path to IO bool. So for example, I can even just try it out here because we are in our um, package demo repository. I can check, and, and in our package demo directory, I can check whether the cabal file for package demo exists. So package demo.cabal, this should ideally, if I execute it, produce the result true if I type the name of the function correctly. Right, but if I just ask for package.cabal, it will give me false. Similarly, if I look further in the source directory, underneath the source directory, mylib.hs exists now, then I'll get true. Or whether the source directory exists on its own. So this is, by the way, the difference between does path exist, there are also does file exist and does directory exist. So, Right, so SRC is a directory. So does directory exist will return true. Does file exist will return false because does file exist actually checks whether something is a regular file. Does path exist is sort of agnostic and just checks whether there is a file system entity of that name. So, um, so that's why does path exist also works. All right, so we can use these now. And we can also generate random numbers. For example, if we want to generate a random number between 1 and 10, we can give this range. And let's look again. So this call is effectively, <laughs> if we specialize all the type classes, is effectively uh, of type IO integer. So um, defaulting, kicking in, um, or we can give an annotation of our own that we want this to be an IO int. And then if we execute this, we actually get a different number. I mean, not every single time, right? It's possible that we get the same random number in this range twice in a row or even three times in a row. But uh, in general, we will get different numbers. Okay. Good, so now we have the, the groundwork laid to be able to use different um, uh, functions from different packages, and we have far more options to, um, to do things with this. And this will also become relevant in the assignments, right? In the, in, in the remaining assignments of the course, we'll also, in principle, open up the floor to, um, to use uh, functions from other packages, which means that the assignments are now no longer single files, but there is um, a Cabal file next to them. Um, so there is always a Cabal file and a Haskell source file. And you should switch to this mode of working where you're um, using, um, where you're using Cabal REPL if you want to, if you interact on the command line, right, remember. Um, remember that that is the replacement for um, for Cabal um, for for GHCI now, because if we if you just call GHCI, you may get error messages right, about about the modules not being found.
Um, there's also the possibility that you'll still get error messages with the um, with the Haskell language server in a situation such as this. It's a little bit fragile in picking up the Cabal file if you're starting the editor from a different directory. So um, that is why there is a, a way to configure explicitly um, how you want to um, have Haskell language server uh, interpret a particular package. And um, you can do so by using an explicit hie.yaml file. I'll explain this as the last step. So there is a particular syntax for this. And in this case, it's just lib colon and the name of the package of package demo. And that should be it. So that is just the syntax that we want here for the, um, for the hie.yaml file. And then um, in this case, it should not change very much. If I, if I load mylib.hs again into, um, into uh, Visual Studio Code, it should, um, it should just pick up the, uh, the package configuration. So as I said, I mean, without the hie.yaml file, it's a little bit um, uh, hit and miss as to from which working directory you're actually starting this. These hie.yaml files, they're explicitly being looked for by a Haskell language server. So if you if you start the editor on a file in, say, this directory source and on mylib.hs, it will go up the directory hierarchy and look for an hie.yaml file explicitly. And if the hie.yaml file then, as here, explains that it should see this as being built using the Cabal project, using the Cabal package package demo, then um, it should definitely work out correctly, regardless of how you're invoking Visual Studio Code. So that um, reduces the amount of fragility a bit. OK, that concludes our excursion. And we'll go back to looking at IO programs now.